We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. <laughs> Experimenting with new slogans. Um, we're also reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of the Ninth Configuration on February 29th, 1980. It was written and directed by William Peter Blatty and released by Warner Brothers. So uh, this is based on a book of his. In 1966, William Peter Blatty wrote the novel Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. And having enjoyed Friedkin's The Night They Raided Minsky's in 1960, he believed he was the perfect man to direct it. Friedkin was game, but they couldn't land a studio. Later, the two collaborated on The Exorcist, obviously. Um, Blatty later came back to the story, developed it more, and connected it canonically to The Exorcist. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. that I, I didn't realize that this... Like, I, I realized that the two of them worked on The Exorcist, but I didn't realize that this wasn't a result of that. So they were actually trying to work on this together even First. before they did The Exorcist. Right. And then after that failed, they came back to do this. Had, and had, it's actually the same cinematic universe. They share a Blatty character. Had written The Exorcist at yes. this point? So he wrote it before yeah. Twinkle Twinkle. Kelly I actually came. don't know when the book uh, The Exorcist came out, but the movie was, what, 73? 73. Um, but... So they came together and made The Exorcist first, um, and the two films are connected through astronaut uh, Captain Billy Cutshaw, who makes an appearance in both films, uh, though played by different actors. He's Dick Callanan in The Exorcist, and he is Scott Wilson in The Ninth Configuration. But you remember that scene with the astronaut when she, the girl goes downstairs and pees on the carpet and says, you're going to die up there? Yeah. That's why he abandons the launch in The Ninth Configuration, is because... Oh. He got this supernatural indication that he was going to die in space. Oh, so that's how they connected him? Yeah. Not, not just visually with that one Both shot? Both of the books had astronauts the before he decided they would mm -hmm. be the same story, but then he came back and um, added that context. But it's kind of weird that you would have the same actor in both movies, and you, but you, like, and you... It's different connect, actors. But, no, no, no. They have... They have this. The, the same actor is in both movies, but he plays different parts. Sure. Oh, I see what you're yeah. saying. You know, well, but they're still trying to connect it to the same universe. That, well, that's kind of weird. Well, there's lots of actors who are in the same movies that right. Peter Blatty wrote, including The Exorcist Three. Uh, right, because you, you have the the cut shot from this film comes back for The Exorcist Three, and so does oh. the uh, the the Doctor Colonel. The right. real doctor. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. The actual uh, one. He, he plays Father Dyer in Exorcist 3. Yeah. But um, William Peter Blatty says that this is the this is the true sequel to The Exorcist. Because nobody likes the actual Exorcist <laughs> 2. Which, is that the heretic? Heretic, yeah. Yeah. With Pazuzu. <laughs> it, it, and it's Linda Blair came back, right? Uh, Linda Blair, I did believe, came back for the second okay. one. And for Repossessed with Leslie Nielsen. That, that one's actually great. Really, was, was she in the third one as well, or just the second one? Because I've seen another one with her in it, but I don't know which I one I watched. The first one. I really hope that it's Repossessed. <laughs> Is no, Roller no, 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 Boogie no. one of the Exorcist <laughs> movies? It must have been the second one that I've seen then. Yep, that's the one I've seen. Okay. <laughs> After looking it up, that is the one I've seen. I don't. If I didn't see that with you, I don't know where I saw it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely haven't seen that one. Yeah. So, but Wilson Scott Wilson, who plays the astronaut here, came back to play Doctor Temple in the third installment. Um, the rewritten version of Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane was released as the Ninth Configuration uh, in '78. The book uh, was released in '78. And even after Exorcist, Blatty had a very difficult time landing a studio, and this time he was attaching himself as director. But you would think after Exorcist did gangbusters at the box office that they would have an easier time. Um, he originally wrote the screenplay adapted from his own book for Columbia. They did, put the did, script in turn around. Did the Exorcist do really well in the, yes. at the yeah. box office? Yeah, it was, it was crazy. I could see how that movie was kind of ahead of its time in terms of things that it was broaching it, subject it was, matter wise i think it it was like a phenomenon though yeah. it was word of mouth just blew that movie up and it was also zero budget like the whole thing is in one house practically yeah well and and uh it was one of the first movies i feel that really had like 
this media attention of people coming out of the theater throwing up or crying or churches or, or, banning people from yeah, going to yeah, see it, it which it, always it, helps yeah it, it, <laughs> it just, it, just it, it does it's a stri sand effect it, it just had this reaction with the populace where people were being interviewed after the movie and like we're, we're in, in the interviews crying like like is it, is it this happened and I don't know what this, I don't know what to feel and like like just people coming out of the theater is just traumatized wow uh, and I don't I don't blame them the what I remember the first time I saw The Exorcist was when it re-released in theaters in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And we were like, oh, we're going to go see this like cheesy horror movie from like the 60s or 70s or whatever. I don't even know. And we go in and watch it. And the whole time I was just like, holy crap, this is terrifying. Like, I remember coming out of the theater shaken. Like, they don't make movies like this anymore. I, I feel bad. The only version of The Exorcist I've seen is like the weird recut that has like the weird faces that appear in the in the void spaces all the time. Yeah, uh, that's the only version of the Exorcist is that not, I've seen. That's not the I regular know that version wasn't of the it. Original. No, I, I think I think that's like the reimagined. Oh, okay, because oh. yeah, that was our only complaint when we were when we rewatched it recently was that it was like these corny faces keep showing up, and yeah. it's like even if it was like one frame at a time, you know, like Tyler Durden style, it mm-hmm. might be better. But they hold on it for like four or five frames, and it's like, what was that dumb face? Well, yeah, it has it has like a persistence of vision effect. Sure, because it's really bright against darkness. Yeah, and then it just kind of slowly your it fades from your eyesight in a weird way. Yeah, I think that it's more terrifying. Well, not that I not that I saw it before I had kids, but you know, ha- having had kids, sure, I think that that's even more terrifying because you know, and 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 being a person of science, you're just like. Yeah, of course we're going to try to find a doctor and, and solve your yeah. your legitimate medical problems. And of course this isn't something supernatural, but then it like legitimately is supernatural and that's horrifying. Yeah, and almost everyone in the movie is portrayed as being at least agnostic if not straight yeah. up atheist, including one of the priests <laughs> for yeah. most of the movie. <laughs> and so it's like by the end of the movie when you're like, oh, all of these people who agree with me that science makes more sense and at the end they're coming to the same conclusion that it's like, no, 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 this is a supernatural monster. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for listening to our Exorcist review. <laughs> hey, we're not going to get to that one, so we might as well cover it here. Yeah. Um, uh, well, it's important because, like you said, it is tied right tied to this in 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 the loosest of ways. But... In the loosest of ways, it's a direct <laughs> sequel, according to the writer director. <laughs> I think that I think that makes it at least uh, connected, um, and it's part of uh, with Exorcist Three is considered. I forget what the name of it is, but they call it like a trilogy for, right. from him. A trilogy is the name word for it. <laughs> well, I know that, but they, there's a, you know, like there's the Lord of the Rings trilogy. There's a name for this trilogy. Of the films. Exorcist trilogy? No, the Exorcist trilogy is Exorcist, Exorcist 2, Exorcist 3. If you ask someone if they've seen the Exorcist trilogy and they said yes, they probably haven't seen the Ninth Configuration. That's true. Because they wasted some time in their life watching The Heretic. Uh, the Exorcist saga? No, it's something like, uh, like the science and religion trilogy or something like that like Blatty good versus science evil and i don't know what it's called who knows gv we don't have the internet in uh, in 1980 so we can't look this up i'm not actually suggesting that you look it up i'm I actually trying to look it up right okay. now <laughs> good luck thank you um i don't even remember where i read it um but yeah so columbia turned the script uh put the script in turn around universal passed on it because no one was willing to risk their reputation on something that columbia turned around um, so Blatty ended up raising $4 million himself for the production and somehow talked PepsiCo into footing another $2 million. Yeah. So of the $6 million budget, a third of that was paid for by Pepsi. Why? Here's why. Because it turns out Hungary has or had, I'm, I'm not clear, um, a regulation in place that prevents the export of local profits. So when they would sell Pepsi in Hungary, they couldn't send the money back to the american corporation okay. they had to spend that money on something in hungary and the, so their first thing was here's what we'll do we'll make it a little bit more money by paying someone to make a film in hungary so that we can pay all the workers there with these this money that we have locked in that country right, and then get the profits and then the take the profits from that movie and they rolled it over into a bottling plant in hungary so that, but they didn't have enough money for the bottling plate in the first place, so they needed an investment that they could pay for and in they, Hungary. That, that, I know. Let's make a movie. That's a great investment. Not only that, but this movie? Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't understand how that came to be. And apparently, so from everything I read, there was no obligation to include uh, the product in the film, but there is a Pepsi vending machine in the movie. Right. I don't remember the Pepsi vending machine. The, one, of the, one of the characters, the multiple personality guy, is dressed up as like a nun and is trying to put oh, money into right, it. Right. I didn't even notice that. It was Pepsi. Yeah. That's how not prominent it was. And I, 
they say that it wasn't it didn't have to be in the movie but i i have a feeling that they might have said like oh well if you're disturbed by the product placement you should know that we just did that as a courtesy and that it wasn't required and it's like <laughs> i bet that was required well they probably like donated a pepsi machine oh, to sure. the production office yeah it's like you know what Rather Let's, than move this thing off set between yeah. shots, why don't we just leave it here? For well, the because whole movie? This, this this set probably was also the production office yeah. since <laughs> the, so, of the budget. And the exteriors are a castle in uh, Germany, but the interiors are all a uh, soundstage in Hungary. Oh, so it wasn't even an actual castle in Hungary. I'm like, why you just, why do you set it in a castle unless you actually have a castle to film in? I don't know. <laughs> The film takes place in the Pacific Northwest, and it's an abandoned yeah. castle, well, like a it's, medieval it's castle. Not even, yeah, and it's not even that. Like they, at some point in the film, they say that this castle was brought over brick, brick by, by brick, brick yeah. and I'm mm-hmm. like, this just seems an unnecessarily elaborate reason to set this here. Yeah. But it's not. I think it's in keeping with most of the movie, which is like unnecessarily elaborate stuff. Well, and it also it also could tie that. There is some kind of supernatural force. Sure, that came being, with it. That came with it because I kept waiting for the statues that were all over this castle to right. play a factor in this movie, and I was horribly angry that they didn't. <laughs> well, it, every time we see one of the statues, there's a person standing next to it doing like a similar pose to the mm. statue. So you get you get the impression that like these gargoyles are like inhabiting the people there, like they're possessed. Yeah. <laughs> um, the film was not a commercial success. I don't know if Pepsi even made their $2 million back, but it did garner a Best Picture nomination at the Golden well, Globes. But it must have gotten enough money because you said they made money enough to make a bottling plant. Well, they got a bottling plant. I don't know if that meant they just infused Hungary with more mm-hmm. money to yeah. get their right. bottling plant or what happened. But um, Blatty actually won for Best Screenplay at the Golden Globes. Um, he also won at the Saturn Awards for the same award, which is a sci-fi awards show they do every year. I don't know if it's a show, but ceremony. Yeah. Um, it was reissued in 1985 under the original book title, Twinkle, Twinkle, Killer Kane. Um, the film is also the origin of the Howie scream. Yes. Which is very exciting. Wait a minute. That scream that I recognized? That scream yeah. that you out? recognized in the bar fight. Yeah. <laughs> that's from this movie. What? I didn't know that. I was just like, oh, they used that cheesy scream that's in every movie. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that was from this movie. No, That's this is awesome. this is the origin of the Howie <laughs> scream. But you can tell too because that guy screams a few times in that scene, and it's very clearly the same voice mm-hmm. of the scream that you hear wow. when he's getting thrown through the window. That's crazy. Um, for our listeners who may not be familiar, the Howie scream is a popular stock sound effect, which is nicknamed after Howie Long's death scene in 1996's Broken Arrow. Which is obviously, that's not the first use of it, but right. that's like a popular one that people recognize it from. Um, if it were up to me, it would be named after its use in the opening theme and title of Nickelodeon's Ah Real Monsters. <laughs> it is the Ah in Ah Real Monsters. Um, and uh, unless I'm mistaken, the film is actually being remade right now in Argentina under the title Compound Nine. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, this was gonna this was going to be on my list of films I'd want to remake. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, why don't we get into the actual story of the film? Uh, we start in that, the castle. Well, we, we start with the ending credits where it's just yeah. a long montage of images of the castle with music and, and <laughs> nothing. I was like, I was like, is the movie already over? What happened? This, Did this, I watch so, it? This, this sounds like the end. I was like, it's like, it's, I'm always worried that there's a corrupted file or something wrong sure, sure. with it. And, and that it's like. Oh, it says it's at the beginning, but this looks like it's it's possibly the ending, and I missed <laughs> the whole movie. Uh, but you're not wrong; it is the ending, also. Yeah. Um, but we, yeah, we start with the castle, just uh, wide shots of this castle in in the woods, and it actually doesn't look unlike the Pacific Northwest, no, no, if no, that's no. what you're calling it. I was just there, haha, <laughs> and it looked just go. like this. Just flew in from Portland, and boy, are he, is he tired? Did you say Portland? <laughs> Sure. Wasn't that the co-host of Tool Time, Bortland? <laughs> Close enough. Um, uh, the first character we see is Cutshaw, astronaut Billy Cutshaw, who is sleeping. Um, oh, no. At, at the beginning, he's sitting in a window, and he's uh, envisioning when he abandoned the launch site of his fateful trip to the moon. 
Um, Wait, which I loved this shot. Yeah, the wide shot of the and thing. Because I was like starting to wonder, like, what is going to happen here? Then, boy, this the massive moon, just moon. Comes up, and I'm like, holy crap! It looks like uh, like one of those like bad ripoffs of 2001, like yeah. a, like a Saturn three shot. Well, I was going to say it actually. This whole montage of him imagining this was reminding me a lot of Saturn three yeah. because like it's all. It's all kind of backlit and and like harsh shadows and. We'll throw a screenshot on the on our Instagram, um, of this of the moon rising behind the the launch site. Uh, our Instagram, by the way, is uh, Vintage Video Pod. If you want to check it out, yeah, we see this giant moon uh, rises behind the rocket, and then he's watch, immediately getting arrested like two, by a team. Yeah, two men mm. attacking him as he's like going crazy. Yeah, oh, they they aren't attacking him. They're like restraining him and pulling him away. Yeah, he had a complete mental breakdown in the capsule. And uh, they're taking him off the launch site, and we cut to him waking up uh, right. in the same room where he was presumably sitting in the windowsill, and he runs to the window and says, someone's coming. Like, he just recognizes psychically that someone's right. on the way. Um, and in another wide shot, the narrator voice reads us the premise to the movie, uh, which is basically that a very high percentage of Vietnam vets are developing mental problems. Um, it's such a high number compared to even other military actions that they think that a lot of them are faking it to get mm-hmm. out of service or to get some sort of a government yeah. pension. So, so the Vietnam War is still happening. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm, right. I'm not asking. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm establishing this for the, oh, yeah, for yeah, the yeah. listeners. Yeah, yeah. The Vietnam War is in full gear. If right. you guys so, didn't know, the Vietnam War is still <laughs> happening. <laughs> okay, now Look out your crazy. windows. We got to go put him in some castle in Hungary. Um but the yeah, so the numbers were so high that they decided that they would start investigating them. Right, because these guys, in theory, are faking it to get out of of duty. Right, much much, much like Mash. The uh, do they do stuff like that in Mash? Well, yeah. There's there there's the uh, the one character who's uh, I want to say it was uh, it's not Klinger who's pretending to be crazy. Yeah, because uh, he's always trying to get out on on the uh, the section eight. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Farrow plays. Yeah, Klinger. I was right. Ha! Huh. There you go. There Look you at that. Go. Richard knew yeah, it. Why so didn't Richard you know is it? Richard totally up on mass. Uh, so yeah, he's always cross dressing and 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 uh, you know wearing exotic women's clothing because he's trying to get it. But this is Korean War. I guess right, I should. Yeah. I guess I should establish also that Kamash is a Korean War. By the way, the Vietnam War. listeners, the Korean War is also ongoing. <laughs> we have uh, always been at war. Yeah, we will true. always be at war. Uh, but yeah, so I think their 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 concern is that. They're faking. Uh, I don't know where <laughs> I'm so lost now. No, that's my all story. No, no, no. I'm they're, sorry. They're faking, and so they're setting up these like these these centers in order to investigate these right. groups of men that they they want to suss out who really needs help and who's just trying to get out of service. Yeah, and so that's like that's the premise of all of these men that are that are at this facility. That's why they're there. And this is the the last the 18th of 18 facilities that were set up, um, and their psychiatrist is inbound. Um, the inmates line up in the courtyard and get a quick dressing down from Major Grouper. Uh, he is not a fan. He's he's not able to handle these people. He's mm-hmm. he's very classic military yeah. type guy. Like yeah. this this is very. If this were later, it would cut. be Arlie Ermy. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Like he's a drill sergeant type. Um, and uh, Colonel Kane wakes up in a car ride on his way into the asylum, and they decide the inmates decide they're going to sing him "You Are My Sunshine" as he's getting out of the car. <laughs> Um, which they quickly follow up by quizzing each other on random movie lines. Mm-hmm. Um, this is where they, one of the lines was the, um, we don't need no stinking badges from Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Yeah. And then we pulled up a list of like the five other movies that that's from after that. We don't need no stinking badges. Treasure of Sierra Madre. What's that? Badges. We ain't got no badges. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. Badges? We don't need no stinking badges. Oh, no. Three badgers. Badgers? Badgers? We don't need no stinking badgers. Uh, Frome, who introduces himself as the medical officer, lets Kane know that this is like, these guys are a problem and he's, he's outnumbered here and he doesn't realize how hard his job is going to be. And then a pair of soldiers come and apprehend Frome, uh, who is an inmate <laughs> posing as a doctor. I loved this moment. <laughs> yeah. I, I really loved it because, like, up until this point, like, you are absolutely sold that this guy is telling the new 
you know, psychiatrist, the lay of the land and like what to watch out for and like, you know, how, how this place works. And then he just gets dragged off. <laughs> yeah. Because he's in full, he's in like the full, like he's got the white, uniform. he's got the white robe and he's the, got pants. the pants. He's got the whole um, business. Yeah. Which we, <laughs> yeah. It was like the inmates are running the asylum. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and then like you, you could just tell from Dr. Kane's face too, that you're just like, Oh God, he's like realizing what he's getting himself yeah. into. He's like, "How are you gonna know what's real?" Yeah, in this I'm gonna place? have to question everything <laughs> that happens now. Um, I, I should also I want to mention right now, listener, if you haven't seen the Ninth Configuration yet, please do what you can to watch it before listening to the rest of this review. We're gonna go through the whole rest of the movie, but this is this is a gem. And I would like for you to see it before yeah. before we spoil any yeah. moments usually, moving forward. You're right. Usually we save our our recommendations for the end, but I, I pa- just pause right now. I go just want to say, movie and yeah. Come back. <laughs> if you have any way to access it, or you know anyone you can borrow it from, watch the movie and then listen to the rest of this because this is really great. Um, I'm I'm giving my up or down away right now, but yeah. Yeah. this is a great film, um, and you should check it out if you haven't seen or even heard of it. Like I hadn't before we started the venture of putting yeah, this podcast together. I don't think any of us together. had seen it. I, I had not seen it, and I had only just heard of it within like the last two weeks. Oh, really? Because uh, uh, they mentioned it on Red Letter Media when they were reviewing Exorcist 3. Oh, okay. And and they just mentioned, oh, yeah, and William Peter Bellotti's Ninth Configuration. And I was like, I think that's one of the movies we're going to watch. <laughs> See, I heard about it last week when Patrick told us this was the next movie we were watching. And he read the description <laughs> And it sounded really awesome. Yeah. And I was not disappointed. Nope. Um, but yeah, so we've gotten that out of the way. If if you've decided you're cool with spoilers and you want to just hear what it's about, then enjoy. Um, but yeah, so uh, Frome is taken away and the the actual Dr. Fell walks up wearing no pants because his pants were stolen by this guy. He's got shorts on. Right. But he's, yeah, he doesn't look like a doctor because he's, right. because he's been robbed. Um and uh the the first thing he says is he calls him vincent and then when kane is like what are you talking about and he said you remind me of vincent van gogh and then just goes off on another tangent right um and uh, later on i think in the same scene kane says you know i I feel like i recognize you but i don't know where from i think it's it's a little bit later but it's it's one scene after the other so right yeah uh... um but grouper is presenting the inmates and you can hear them peeing on the ground behind him and yeah. he just makes it like rolls his eyes like pissed off face but he doesn't even turn around to see them doing it he just knows what they're doing already i, um, I had to fluctuate the volume whenever stacy keach was talking to like turn it way up i was like is he he's whispering in every scene i can't yeah. hear what he's saying yeah he's he is very quiet and like flat monotone when he's talking but it's it's a it's a very chilling effect yeah mm. and i i swear like 90 percent of the scenes in this movie he's he's making this face in which he's sort of got like his he's his, like pursing his lips a little bit right and just, he's got his eyes are kind of a little extra wide like he's like a little shocked by everything he sees but yeah. like composed <laughs> yeah um we cut to the first night uh at the asylum for for kane anyway and uh robert loja is in blackface singing to an al jolson record <laughs> Um, in, in front of uh, Moses' yeah. gun's character. Yeah, yeah, Moses' gun is just watching him. Like, not super offended, but like unimpressed. Just like, yeah, yeah. Ugh, this is happening. And then uh, someone walks in and turns off the record. I think Grouper turns it off. Um, another inmate, uh, Fairbanks, uh, which is the multiple personality inmate, uh, takes a, a large hammer to a wall inside the castle and just starts pounding it in a hole. <laughs> and Grouper comes over and he's like, what are you doing? And like tries to take it away from him. And then Kane is like, no, no, no. We got to let him do this. Like, we're going to talk to him and have a conversation. Yeah, his explanation about what he's doing is yeah. fabulous. Because he's, he's talking about how he's trying to pass through the walls and the molecules are not accommodating him. So right. he's like trying to teach them a lesson. <laughs> yeah. He's making an example of the atoms in this wall because he believes he can concentrate hard enough so that the atoms of his body will arrange themselves so that he can fit through the holes in that wall. But, but I love how Cain convinces him to take the hammer. He's like, I'd like to study it. Yeah. And he's like, you're not going to play around with it. Are you? He's like, no, 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 no. no, no. Well, yeah, because he says, it, you know, it might not be the problem with the wall. It might be, a problem with the molecules and the hammer so he's gonna study it and, like, <laughs> and the guy's like interesting theory like right. already respects him 
Um, but yeah, that like just from that moment already, I was like, I already love the dialogue in this movie, and yeah. I totally get why it won the best screenplay Golden Globe. And well, and this scene is sort of setting up like his, um, you know, his desire to sort of indulge the inmates to try to to try to cure them, right? Because he thinks that uh, the resistance that they've been feeling is not helping their problem. Um, and uh, so Fell brings Kane the patient's files when Cutshaw bursts into the room. And just completely, like, shatters pieces of the... Yeah. Like, the ceiling comes down. <laughs> and... Every time he kicks this door open, you have, like, more chips of plaster falling on his shoulders. Because he's just so violently kicking the door in. Um and he's trying to introduce himself and kind of get a feel for this, the new psychiatrist. Um, he says his name is is Hudson Kane. And he says, can I call you HUD? And then Fell, the doctor in the background, says, Try calling him Colonel. Are you the one that makes the chicken? Colonel Kane's a psychiatrist. Sure. And they told me you were a doctor. This man treats crocodiles for acne! <laughs> he's just, like, totally <laughs> insane already. Um and uh, he, he slowly walks over to the other doctor and sits down and you hear this crunch sound because <laughs> he's got a bag of Fritos, Fritos? in his pocket. Yeah, yeah. And he says, I think the end of the world just came for that bag of Fritos I had in my pocket. <laughs> but, but it's just such a wonderful recurring like Every time he sits down. Every single time he sits down, there's another slight crunch. <laughs> yeah, he does it like two or three more times in this scene. And every time you hear the same distinctive Frito crunch, um, he demands that Kane read his file out loud. And sits down, the Frito bag crunches again. Um, and Cutshaw accuses Kane of coveting his St. Christopher medal. Which, by the way, there's also a, a medal in The Exorcist. But it's not a St. Christopher medal. I think it gets referred to in the book as a St. Christopher medal, but it's a St. Joseph medal in the movie. Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, you can't really tell like the, the writing in the exorcist on the metal is not, right not but the metal plays an important part in both of these films it's yeah. clearly uh, yeah. one of the connective tissues I, I like i like when they reveal the thing about the metal because you know the doctor clearly hadn't even noticed he was wearing it and then he's like oh you're coveting it and he's like you know no i'm not and he's like oh you don't like it and he's like no it's really it's really lovely and he's like oh i knew see, you were I coveting you it. it you know it's like <laughs> saint christopher the patron saint of travelers Okay, interesting. As in a traveler to space. Or to Vietnam. Other places. Mm -hmm. well, Although Kutcha is the not, one wearing it. Yeah, he's not an army vet, I don't think. Well, he's... Well, he's... He's, he's military He's of military, some sort. yeah. But right. But he, he didn't... He, I don't he, think he served with the armed forces. No, I... Well, Unless I, they I think they are astronauts. implying that he was... Yeah, he's a Marine. Yeah. These are all oh, Marines. They are all, okay. Uh, but he... He was a Marine who then went to into the, the space, space program. program. Right. Okay, um, he, and he keeps saying that he thinks he's going to steal his medal, and he says, "Well, you're going to now. I got to worry about you trying to steal my medal when I'm asleep." And he says, "Well, if I were to do that, you might awaken." And he says, "Like hell, I'd awaken. Powerful drugs could be insinuated into my soup." <laughs> <laughs> I just love every single line that this character says for the whole rest of the movie. Um, that he puts him through a quick Rorschach test, and his first response is, an old woman in funny clothes throwing poison darts at a buffalo, and then Fell corrects him, it's a bison. <laughs> <laughs> but then my favorite line in this whole scene comes actually from uh, from Kane, because the, the third of the three Rorschach tests, he says, Kafka talking to a bed bug, and Kane very like nonchalant just goes, Correct. You're full of shit, you know that? <laughs> <laughs> and and Kutshaw is like, equal parts furious and like deeply respectful for yeah. this ridiculous answer <laughs> yeah and once again this is like this is the second time now in the film that we have kane just i mean like i think he was trying to be funny but at the yeah. same time he's just indulging the fantasy yeah mm -hmm. because he's like we're just gonna be weird with this guy because he's weird and is that's it, the his language is this the part where he says who are you you're too human to be human yeah, he might. It might be. I, I know he says it to Kane in in the office. But yeah, there's there's, there's a, a few scenes. times where he makes the observation. He's like, "What is up with this guy? I, he can't get a read on him." Um, he throws open the door again to leave, and a bunch of ceiling dust breaks apart again. Um, and then Reno follows a dog into Kane's office, and uh, <laughs> he says he saw Grouper in a cypress tree talking to an owl. <laughs> I couldn't hear what they were saying. They were whispering. Yes. 
<laughs> and uh, and Fel says, well, there's there's no cypress trees on the grounds. And he says, well, a cypress tree can be dug up and anyone with money can fill a hole. And he's like, I hadn't considered that. Very clever. <laughs> and I love how Fel just lays on the couch with his back turned. He's like, okay, I'm just going to I'm going to take a nap during this whole ordeal. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had enough of these people for today already. Um, his uh, The dog that he brought into the office is auditioning for Reno's adaptations of Shakespeare plays for dogs. Well, it's not just any dog. It's it's a poolie. Right, this one is a poolie. It's a yeah, very special dog. Um, I forget what part. Well, weren't they saying he was going to be Hamlet? Well, he he did say that he was worried about casting a Great Dane, like right. It's two I, on oh, the I, nose. I I just assume yeah, <laughs> that made me laugh really hard. <laughs> I just assumed that they were casting the poolie so they wouldn't cast a Great Dane. Maybe as that Hamlet. was maybe that was his point there. <laughs> um, but uh, then Spinell walks in, uh, his assistant in the audition process for the the dog plays and spinel is played by joe spinel a character that is not in the book or script for this movie and is just a personal friend of william blatty's who was like please put me in this movie um by the way i looked into it joe spinel by the way we had earlier already do you remember joe spinel uh no he was in cruising he was one of the cops that was uh uh, shouting at the transvestite hookers at the beginning of the movie uh, okay. and was like abusing them in the car well i like um, the char- i like his character in this movie because he's just this great foil to uh what reno reno, reno yeah. Our, yeah. our casting director like he's just who by the way is played by uh father uh father karis father karis yeah from yeah. uh from, from the, the exorcist. exorcist um and i i neglected to mention this before joe spinell so this is his second film in 1980 for us he will appear in six more films on our schedule this year. Oh, jeez. This year alone. So he'll be in eight films in 1980? Eight films in 1980. Wow. The other six coming down the pipe, we have The Little Dragons. He was in Forbidden Zone. <gasps> He's in Maniac, Brubaker, Melvin and Howard, and The First Deadly Sin. So we're going to see a lot of Joe Spinell over the course of this he year. He must have just been friends with like everyone in Hollywood. I think so. <laughs> We also need to mention uh, returning for uh, Tom Atkins. Right. Yeah. Uh, Krebs. Yeah, Krebs. He's one of the, the soldiers that's uh, working here at the at the um, asylum. Did we see Tom Atkins already? He uh, was uh, J- uh, Jamie Lee Curtis's oh, yes. boyfriend in the yes, fog. Yes, yes, yes. I recall now. Yes. Um, and Spinell, as he's entering the room, is showing uh, a dog that he's considering for either Rosencrantz or Guildenstern. But Reno is mad because it's the wrong gender. The Rosencrantz, the Guildenstern are men, and this is a female dog. I don't know why that's a problem. We're it's obviously not. I don't. I don't know why gender bending would be a problem in Shakespeare. We do it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> just call them Rose, Rose and Guild. Those are both girls' names. Gil, Gil- just, Gilda, or, or Jill, Gilda Stern. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So yeah, uh, at night, Kane agrees with Fell's theory that shock therapy could be curative. He thinks that. Benish, which is Robert Loge's character, may need Thorazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, he asks Krebs for a key to the medicine cabinet because Fell isn't around now. But that's just a pretense, right? I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, he seems already stoned when he's saying that. But he's yeah. like, I need to get into the medicine cabinet. I don't have a key. Where can I find a key? And he said, oh, Fell has one, but he's not here right now. And he says, is there another key to the medicine cabinet? And you think, oh, he's, di- he's diagnosed that Loge's character needs Thorazine. But he doesn't have a key to the cabinet and fells out for the night. So we're just going to have to skip that dosage. No, they didn't skip the dosage. No, no. Um, uh, do you believe at this point that Krebs is in on what's happening? Because um, we know later that Groper isn't. But Krebs seems to have this weird kind of... He does seem like he like he's more knowledgeable. Right. And like an overly respectful to him. Maybe. Well, I thought that he, was just because he was younger. Yeah, I was going to say it's a military thing, and he's senior to him. Mm. But he's senior to Grouper, too. I mean, Grouper is having to do everything that he says. Yeah, but I think Grouper in general is just kind of, is just more straight-laced and isn't, sure. isn't cool with the indulging inmates. Yeah, I don't know if that's, I, it could be It could be either. It could go either way. Because I wasn't clear. And, and, it, and like I said, he just seems to have like this, like a kinship, like he's always kind of like, kind of happy to be around. Yeah. Colonel Kane, he's like, you need anything else, sir? Like, like, yeah. like, just like, just being friendly. And and I and I was and he is trying to be helpful here, even though he's just like it. It comes down to no, I don't have a key. Yeah. So and he says, oh well, we'll have to talk about making one because I should have one too. 
and mm-hmm. it's like do we trust you around these drugs i don't know maybe maybe we do um so now after this conversation with krebs uh cutshaw bursts into the office with his slippers and trunks and says hey let's go to the beach let's go to and the kane says well it's night it's and night raining and, it's raining. <laughs> and he says i see you're determined to start an argument <laughs> it's just such a great line um uh cutshaw says that he doesn't believe in god and they have a long conversation about it that he does believe in the devil he doesn't believe in god but he does believe in the devil um and he keeps referring to god as a foot mm-hmm. um because he's just like oh well might as well. it's it's basically like the spaghetti monster right right thing right. where it's just like oh well whatever we can say he is whatever we want to say and and uh and he just gives a lot of examples of like terrible things that right. happen in the real world that so there can't be a god there's only right. a devil because there's so much evil yeah um and it specifically it seems like he's referring to like terrible things that that he's seen done in the war mm-hmm. um not even having to do with his, and his breakdown at space there, there's so many of these scenes that come together so i always forget which one is this the one where he says name one thing that was good i, I think he does that more than once but he yeah. does he does have part of that conversation right um but he's just he, well, and, and every that, time he tries to bring up an example of something good he says oh he says like oh well what about when someone jumps on a grenade to save his friends and he says oh that's just a reflex and he says what about when someone like who's sick on a lifeboat jumps overboard to protect everyone else and then he says i, I can't remember how he diffuses that well, he one. wants but he wants to he wants an example that he's seen that he's personally seen in right. his life mm-hmm. of, of some of like selfless good yeah, but yeah, so th- they, they have this conversation in multiple parts over the course of the movie. But I think that's as much as we get in this scene. Um, some of the soldiers speak with Fell about a plan they have to sell to the higher-ups. Like, we see where Fell is when he's out of the office, and mm-hmm. he's walking to a gate with a bunch of other, like, generals or higher-up military figures. Um, and they're telling him, like, oh, so do you think it's going to work? Like, are we going to be able to talk them through this plan? And we don't really know what the plan is but there's something going on behind the scenes that he's a part of right um reno and spinel sit at the table casting different dog breeds for different roles in hamlet <laughs> it was a fabulous scene. yeah reno's just, just getting angrier and angrier just naming off roles and dog breeds one after the other and yeah it's just it's wonderful and then it's like he he starts to like shout at spinel because he's he doesn't like spinel's sarcastic responses to everything and he's like polonius and he's like you you're not taking me seriously you're not you're not listening to what i'm saying we need to have and he's like polonius like i don't <laughs> i'm done listening just tell me what kind of dog breed we need for polonius and then he's like a chow and he's like a chow and that's like enough to set reno like off like just like <laughs> oh god oh, he's so furious and they're working on the the star dog in the background is like having problems breathing or something like oh, that. Was he? I didn't yeah. notice that. Well, one, there's like a doctor. The fake doctor is seeing to the dog, and he says, "I think this dog is suffocating." Or oh, something well, like that. that yeah, because it's so it's a pulley, and yeah. if you if you aren't familiar with pulleys, they're the they look like they have dreadlocks, like they have these these you know yeah. long tight knotted curls of hair. It on looks them. like a mop. It's a yeah. giant mop. But then after Reno like flips out on him and gets angry and like storms off, Spinel's like, "Not challenge that bad." Like he's like, "I wasn't even trying to criticize. That was that's a good choice." Reno and Cutshaw are sitting in a tree the next day, and uh, Reno is telling Cutshaw that he thinks that that Kane is crazy. Um, he says that he's Gregory Peck and Spellbound. He's nuts. <laughs> he's, uh, you got to keep an eye on this guy because I can't get a read on him either. So I've never seen Spellbound, but based on the context, it seems like it's got a similar plot, like that that we have a crazy military person. Is that? You know, I didn't actually look into it. Have you seen it, Richard? What's the other one with the, the captain that goes crazy, the boat captain that goes crazy and they have to mutiny? Kane mutiny. Is it the Kane mutiny? That, that's, 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 that's the reference I thought he would have made here. Uh, Wait, the K, like is it spelled the same? Like, is 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 Kane's last name a no. reference to that no, film? No, no, no. no it's, it's it's Kane's name is actually a reference it, when he first uh, mentions Killer Kane in the in when he's talking about his brother as a soldier. Killer Kane is the bad guy from Buck Rogers. What is Buck Rogers? It's like Flash Gordon. Like, yeah, it's like the original yeah. like future futurist comic strip. Oh, okay. And it was made into like serialized shows and movies. Uh, Spellbound, is, according to IMDb, psychi- uh, psychiatric 
a psychiatrist <laughs> protects the identity of an amnesia patient accused of murder okay. while attempting to recover his memory. So, so, that's... but I'm assuming that maybe he is the person mm. that maybe that's the twist. Of, I don't know. It, it's a Hitchcock Spelman. movie. So, so it probably yeah. is a twisty thing. Like he is, he the... didn't like twists. So it's probably not that. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Loja, uh, comes into the office and is shouting <laughs> in Kane's face. You're not an arch man. Stand here and fungus up to my asshole, you bastard. You're a giant brain. Please give me back my flying belt. Hold your still escape, I swear to God. I won't. Give me the flying he, belt. This whole tear that he goes on is really incredible. And it's just a, a masterpiece from Loja. And he wants his rocket belt. Yeah, he's like, I want my flying belt back. Please just give me my flying belt back. I know you have it. <laughs> and these people come into the office to take him away. And he starts shouting at them. And... The voice that he's using to shout at them reminded me of like when Beetlejuice starts shouting. You're giving me my fire belt! Oh, my fire belt! You're giving me my fire belt! Come on! What are you doing? (laughs) It's like freaking out on them. Um, But it's so great. And uh, and then in this dream sequence that we have, and uh, is this Kane's dream with with the astronaut on the moon? Well, well, I mean, this is Kane's dream, but it doesn't. He he claims it doesn't belong to him. It belonged to his brother uh so yes <laughs> yeah so kane is having this dream and an astronaut is on what i think is supposed to be the moon but there's these really tall crystals yeah. sprouting out of it so this is what i wanted to ask when we got to this moment yeah does this movie in this universe has man gone to the moon because vietnam spanned a long time so at this point have we been to the moon? Because Cutshaw was supposed to go there alone. Well, the book, the original book came out in 66. So that was pre-moon. Correct. Pre-moon. But by now, for the writing of the movie, we are aware of... In the year the story takes place, have we been to the moon? Or well, was there a setback but, but in the space the program? But here's the thing. this is I couldn't wrap my head around this. And I'm sorry if I'm going to go on a little bit of a tirade on this. The rocket that we see that Cutshaw is about to board is not enough to, to get, get to, to the, the moon. moon. It's to get to <laughs> orbit, but not to the moon. And, and it certainly, you wouldn't, they did, we didn't go to the moon alone. We never have gone to the moon just one person. Right. Not even yeah. to, to like orbit the moon. It is a multiple crew required. Yeah. One of them doesn't even get to go to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> they have to like pilot the thing that floats around the moon. Uh, so this vision of the moon seems to be based on a vision of we have not yet been to the moon even though the so so, so you're saying it's like a millier stylistic moon but it also could just be the naive dream of a person who who hasn't has no experience with you know space exploration right but i'm it's possible that uh him aborting this mission was such a setback for the space program that they had to put off the moon landing for Right. extra time and as a result the people on this planet don't know what the surface of the moon looks that, like that's what i'm trying to get yeah comprehend i mean i think In, technically speaking we knew what the surface of the moon looked like because you could see it from here with the telescope <laughs> but the, uh, someone could imagine potentially in, mm-hmm. for the purposes of a dream like a psychedelic dream that they're having right. that the moon has these big crystallic cr- crystal like structures yeah. also crucifixes so, <laughs> right also yeah. jesus being crucified yeah so so th- then my question stands in this movie has mankind been to the moon in your That's opinion? That's a question for Blatty. <laughs> um, in my opinion, I'll say no. I, yeah, I, I was going to go I with no as well. No. Um, Though I think it is interesting that we're trying to like suss out if this guy, if this astronaut is crazy or not. Because is the implication like, stop being crazy. We're going to send you to the moon the second we figure out you're faking it. Like, Would, yeah. they, would they honestly still want to send him to the moon? Yeah. Well, he's a lunatic. Ooh, so ah. this is perfect. No, for sure they they had a backup person that they would have sent that day, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, but but yeah. So in this dream, an astronaut is walking around on the moon. Does he plant a flag? He plants a flag right in front of this crucifix, and then he turns around and like kind of like looks up at Jesus. Looks up, but like in kind of like a either a pelvic thrust kind of motion, but yeah. doesn't actually do the thrust. Jesus has arms 
out, out, outstretched. Outstretched, reaching for the crucifix. We'll throw I like a screenshot that of that. There's arms outstretched, and your go to is it's kind of like a pelvic thrust. Yeah. <laughs> well, because he is kind of like arching well, his back a little back, bit. Well, he's leaning back, but yeah. he's. But I would have more thought leaning back with your arms open was more of like an awe thing or taking something in. Well, maybe if he had dropped thrusting. to his knees, but it looked like he was about to go like a Fonzie, like, hey. <laughs> maybe hey, that's Jesus. what he was doing on set. Um, but this scene, they actually shot this scene on the moon. No, I, no. <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was on the sound stage. <laughs> it was the same sound stage as the 69 <laughs> moon shooting. Moon. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, he wakes up from that dream and fell is in his room. So Kane tells Fell about this dream that he had, this moon dream. Or I guess he doesn't really tell him the details of the dream. Yeah, he um, just tells he, him. He wakes he has up a from dream. a nightmare and says he ha- he had this terrible dream, and that it's a dream that he inherited from someone else. But I'm convinced that the dream he's talking about is not the moon dream. That when he says he had a terrible dream that happened to someone else, he's not because there he didn't have any other astronaut patients up to this point. Mm-hmm. When he says he had a terrible dream, I think he's talking about something we see later in the film uh, that happened in Vietnam. But he says, it wasn't even something that happened to me. It was a dream that a patient had that he told me about, and I've been having it ever since. And then he mentions that the specific patient was this famous psychopath from Vietnam Mm -hmm. who people refer to as Killer Kane. And he just kind of went nuts and killed a bunch of people. Um, And and his name got around that he was famous. Fell recognizes the name um, first as the villain from Buck Rogers, but then... Um, says, oh, yeah, you're talking about the Vietnam guy. Yeah, I've heard of him. I actually met him once. We palled around for a while. And he's like, yeah, he was my brother. He was a murderer. Yeah, which is why. So now we know that there's two Canes, and one of them is a murderer. And he says, oh, you, how, how is your brother? I haven't seen him in a long time. And he said, he's dead. And right after he says he's dead, someone else busts in the office to talk to him and fell immediately, steps outside the office, and just bursts into tears mm-hmm. outside the room. Which yeah, I'm not clear on what the tears like what he's actually feeling here if he's if he's upset or if he's well i think i think it does make sense by the end of the film Um, right i mean i mean we could talk about it now i I think we should save it um we'll come back to the tears for sure because i think it is an important moment for that character a grouper comes in complaining that an inmate has been writing love letters to nearby women um, under his, his name, name. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he's also especially offended by the fact that uh, the letters have been faked to look like they came out of a mimeograph like they literally say to occupant <laughs> like he's so desperate for a woman that he's sending this to every single house well, that doesn't have time to address them properly but he's also really upset about the fact that the women were ugly right he, <laughs> some of them called the facility and he said that he invited the women with like nicer sounding voices to come down to the building and they showed up and they're ugly and that's why he's offended <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's no real resolution to this right. plot point uh, it's just another funny terrible thing that they did to grouper uh reno comes in to debate with kane whether hamlet is actually crazy in the story of hamlet um because experts uh vacillate between saying he's pretending to be crazy or he actually is crazy and he only thinks he's pretending to be crazy and then uh, Kane asks what Reno's opinion is, and Reno kind of spells out the story a little bit, and then Kane elaborates to agree with him, basically, that he's not crazy, and by pretending to be crazy, he's actually protecting himself from going insane because of everything that's happening around him. And Reno is so excited to hear that Kane agrees with him, and that the dog was wrong. <laughs> the whole point of this conversation <laughs> was for the dog to overhear it and to understand hamlet's motivation because the dog had disagreed with him about whether or not hamlet was crazy i love the analogies to you know to the movie itself in here i think it's just really nicely written yeah and then after reno leaves with the dog kane turns to fell and says we need to get some supplies we're going to indulge the men Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is when the movie gets like turned up an extra notch into crazy town (laughs) um Reno kicks a dog out of auditions that did a terrible job. Namek comes out from behind the curtain wearing a Superman costume with an N where the S should be. <laughs> um, <laughs> which it's pretty clear what this, this African-American character's nickname would have been in the, at the time. Yeah. Um, no nonsense, man. No nonsense. Or maybe it's just Namek for his name. But he says, there's no place for a superhero in this Shakespeare play. Stop trying to force superheroes into this. And then Loja flies by. <laughs> <laughs> it is in his flight belt. 
<laughs> it just leaves this like really gently puffs of smoke yeah. lingering in the air. It's very like by. steampunk invention. Um, there's <laughs> the sound it makes, like a yeah, <laughs> and then you just hear him crash off camera, <laughs> like head first into a wall. Um, and then a team of medics run by, but it's like the crazy fake medic people. Mm. And, one uh, of which is dressed. One of is a one bearded man men. dressed as a male, female nurse. Yes. Yeah. I just um, I, I like the idea that there are lead crazy people who have these like crazy fantasies, and then they're supporting crazy people, yes. like the, you know the nurses and the, the Great Escape crew. Yeah. Where where they're like you know they're going through the whole things like Tom, Dick, and Harry naming the naming yeah naming the all the tunnels. Um. I also think. So, what do you guys think? Do you think that? Loja had a flight belt the whole time and this is it or do you think this is part of their indulging and he literally got a flight belt from the military yeah i, I think mean, it's part of the indulging yeah i think so too i think he literally was like we need a some sort of a jet pack which is funny because when they call they call, so so they call to get the yeah. supplies and, and 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 the guys on the other end are just like what is going on yeah. what what is this you know what is the astronaut like you know outfit for yeah and no they didn't bring up a flight belt but no. i think i would be questioning that slightly more than all the dogs and astronaut outfits yeah and in vintage world war ii uh German nazi uniforms SS uniforms <laughs> yeah that's great um so yeah, the men grouper is really bad about having yeah. to wear a nazi uniform. he comes into the office and he's like why do i have to wear this and he's like it's for th- it's a common form of therapy where we're uh we're letting them identify as the allied soldiers and and they're the prisoners and we're the guards and he's like we're the prisoners and he <laughs> freaks out on kane but this is the first time kane actually loses it back on yeah. him he's like you're gonna wear that uniform sleep in it bathe in it try to take it off and you'll die in it is that clear and Grouper's just like shaken to the bone yeah. and turns around and walks out. But he he wears his uniform for the rest of the time that he's mm-hmm. supposed to, which isn't very long because Cutshot immediately comes in and says, tomorrow we're switching roles. Here's here's the script. Um, you'll notice you crack in hour three of the interrogation or something like that. <laughs> or page three or whatever he says. Um, and then he like sits down and tries to read his face again. He's like, who are you? What are you? I can't figure you out. And then he tells him the story of, P.T. Barnum's Panther and Lamb show, which impressed everyone because a panther and a lamb seemed to be best friends. Um, but what wasn't clear to the audience, but was the actual fact, is that every day at, at intermission, the panther would eat the lamb and they would replace it. So it would seem like these two animals got along swimmingly when, in fact, it was just because the panther was full. And Cutshaw talks about pain and death and how God wouldn't allow it. Cain continues to speak in defense of religion and that maybe God's plan is beyond us to understand. And all these things, terrible things have to happen for his plan to work out. Maybe the pain is important to the plan. Um, and th- this is where they have the, the conversation about whether there's uh, such thing as a selfless sacrifice. Which is actually a conversation that um, recurs in an episode of Friends. Um, <laughs> wait, wait, where what? Phoebe <laughs> is trying to say that you can be selfless and help people oh except she feels good every time she and they were like oh well you help someone so you feel good about it so it's not selfless and finally at the end of the episode her act of selflessness is to let a bee sting her Uh, you know the bee probably died after he stung you (laughs) damn it i guess we could also call back saturn three sure yeah with the the one lesson that uh, Hector couldn't learn would yeah. be the, the self-sacrifice. The self-sacrifice. Lesson. Yeah. He doesn't robots understand just that don't play. Understand. Will Smith was right. Robots just don't understand. <laughs> That's what he said, right? That was in the iRobot soundtrack. Uh, I yeah. never, never saw that movie. <laughs> it's okay. It's got problems, but it's okay. Is it okay? I like it. Okay. I, you know what? I it's l- not a faithful adaptation. No, I, I will at say. All. I will say I enjoy the movie iRobot. All right. He's going on the record. Folks. I don't recommend anyone watch it. <laughs> you enjoy it, but don't watch it. <laughs> After this uh, conversation slash argument, Cutshaw asks Kane to take him to mass tomorrow. He does, and Cutshaw basically embarrasses him. For I think he recognizes the priest and is like, "Oh, is that so and so?" Like calling out his name, mm-hmm. and the priest like seems to be familiar with him because he's like immediately like, "Oh God, this guy's here." Yeah. For a moment, Kane sees like a Vietnamese boy superimposed where a Caucasian altar boy just was, right. and then he switches back. Uh, so he's like kind of freaking out here um cutshaw stands up and as soon as he starts talking the priest who's like not even facing him just like 
starts shaking his head like, oh God, no, please mm-hmm. don't do this. And he just stands up and says, Infinite goodness means creating a being that you know in advance is going to complain. And they just cut immediately away from this scene. Like that was probably just the beginning of a whole long lecture that he gave <laughs> to the entire church. But then um, comes a very important line as they return to the hospital. The, if there's an afterlife and you die first, Will you give me a sign? Right. And he says, I'll try. Yeah. Um, so Cutshaw back. says that to Kane. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And Kane says, I'll try. Um, so back at the castle, uh, the inexplicable <laughs> Pacific Northwest castle, uh, Loja in a full spacesuit approaches Kane and asks for his mail. <laughs> He's like, is there any mail for me? My mom used to send me cheesecakes when I was on Mars for a few years. <laughs> um and he's like oh yeah no there's nothing sorry and he he's like oh that's fine and he turns and just walks through like a a bunch of paintings that are stood up yeah and just like knocks them all (laughs) over as he walks out of the room krebs tells kane that there's a new patient in his office and that he seems like a pretty normal guy but he's obviously here so he's got some kind of problem um and as soon as kane turns to see the guy it's someone who he served with and uh and the guy recognizes him and it says, Killer Kane. It's Killer Kane. Uh, confirming what I'm sure we all suspected at this point that the crazy Vietnam vet was actually Kane here, not his brother. And then we get an insane flashback. It's from the perspective of this patient who sees Kane through some trees and some leaves. And he says, What's going on, Kane? What, what are you holding there? And Kane's standing there in the rain in the jungle. Just a boy. Forget about it, sir. Let's get out of here. I cut off his head with the wire. And he kept on talking. What are you holding? What's that in you? And then the camera pans down, and we get this shot of this corpse lying behind him, and he's holding this Vietnamese boy's head. It looks like a 10, 12-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. And it is horrifying, this shot. It's a fully realistic looking head for the way that they framed it and yeah. shot it here. Yeah. And it, this movie is just like constantly sidelining you with these insane images. And I, I was shaken after, the, like even rewatching it today to like prep my notes for this. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy, this scene. So it seems like in the aftermath of, I don't, I don't know if this is like a single victim incident or if this was like a me lie and this is like just the aftermath. Yeah. Uh, I get the impression that this is not the only person that he went crazy and killed. No, I, I think I think the implication that he, he this is the the one the the uh, straw yeah. that broke the camel's yeah. back. Well, because they mentioned earlier when they talk about this the killer Kane person that, that he killed a lot that he killed a lot of people. Like I, I even forget I forget the number, but you know one guy said a number and the other one and then Kane oh, said I heard no, it, was. it was like you know 37 or something yeah. like that it was much higher than whatever he thought it was yeah and the other one tried in in dr fellows right says well it's in service it's in of war the country it's yeah war, you're, you're a hero you're doing what you doing what he had to do yeah um and it seems like in the aftermath of this breakdown that he had that either well not a computer error at the time a paperwork mishap yeah caused him to be sent to this psych ward as a doctor because there is another colonel kane who is his brother yes it turns out his brother is is also a colonel and who his last name is Kane and is a psychiatrist and they mistook him for his brother and so sent him to the hospital to work. Kane passes out after this encounter with the patient who remembers his past. Cutshaw finds out what happened and goes mm. crazy, completely destroys Kane's office and is shouting at Grouper um, that, you know, this, this guy is the killer. You brought the killer in here. Like he's freaking out about it because he's like, I was right the whole time. This guy's a psychopath and we need to get him out of here. What are you doing? The staff does their best to contain this information. Mm-hmm. They get the new patient on board and, and say, like, you can convince these people that that you were mistaken, right? Because we're trying to keep this under wraps. Kane doesn't seem to remember any of what happened when he wakes up. Well, so he explains all of this in a room with all of the other... All the guards. Yeah, the guards. So Krebs is there and Grouper is there. So they're... Right. They're all sitting there, and they're they're clearly like not happy with this because yeah. this guy came in and uprooted their lives to you know indulge all these you know psychopath fantasies, right? Um, and and now they have to just go along because the idea is that going along with this will cure him, right? But also, he thinks that 
Um, and it seems to be true that Kane has a better chance of getting through to these inmates. I don't know if even inmates is the right word, but the people patients. here at this assignment, the patients here, it, it seems like Kane has a better chance of getting through to them than any of the doctors have had, but also that by getting through to them, he will cure himself. So if he's able to fix even one person there, it will offset some right. of the guilt right. he has for they're, what he's they're done. They're trying to have him work through this by doing some sort of redeeming act. Right. Um, and this is where Fell reveals that he is the other Colonel Kane. He's the actual psychiatrist, Hudson Kane, and that Vincent Kane, Killer Kane, is his brother. Um, that he orchestrated this transfer and wants to keep an eye on his brother to make sure that he stays safe. So this explains his tearful exit. Right. In that... When, he, is, when he says he's dead, mm -hmm. that's when he loses it because he's realizing that that not only has his brother assumed his identity, but that he thinks of himself as dead. Like mm -hmm. the person he was before doesn't exist anymore. And so for... I think the point is supposed to be that for Hudson... That he's that he's lost his brother here. Correct. He's crying at the death of his brother, like the psychological okay. death of the brother that he grew up with. See, I wasn't clear on that because at the same time, his motivation here is to get his brother over this, you know, cr you know, crazy whatever he was going through in in the war where he was killing all these people and get him past that and get him back to the brother that he used to be. Right. And and this this revelation from Cain is that. That brother is is no more. There is no Vincent Kane anymore. He's dead. So you don't get him back. All, the best thing you're going to get is this confused guy who doesn't seem to know who he is because your brother is dead. So is so is Fell's actual name Hudson Kane? Yes. Correct. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So while they're having the, these conversations, uh, Cutshaw still angry about the revelation steals a car and drives it out of the asylum to a nearby like biker bar um <laughs> which which then follows just the craziest i was like i felt like this is a movie on its own yeah I was like, I, it's like 25 minutes this bar room scene yeah it's like the whole last quarter of the movie takes place in this bar and these guys are just as crazy as our patients <laughs> yeah they feel like a precursor to the biker gang from road warrior not even like the mad max people but specifically the road warrior people they're all peacock in it they've got like eyeshadow on and weird like flourishes in their hair and... but they're also strangely eloquent yeah like the way they refer to each other like it's it's, it's richard and stanley are the two kind of leaders yeah of of the gang and and why would anybody refer to themselves as Richard? <laughs> well, yeah, so you, they throw nicknames around though. They wouldn't, they wouldn't yeah, go yeah, by those names. Yeah, you you would have like like wheels and stab, <laughs> <laughs> which is also my nickname. Yeah, <laughs> wheels and stab. Yeah, it's a complicated story. Because Richard wheels. Yeah, we get it. All right, just check. <laughs> one, one time I wrote my name wrong, <laughs> and then I stabbed myself out of anger. But. Uh, also, I got really excited when I saw one of the other biker gang. Uh, Who's that? Tim Rosovich. Of, Wait, is he in there? Of the political prisoner of MacGyver. Oh my gosh, I totally missed that in the credits. Tim Rosovich. Yeah, so he is, he's got a couple of, of clear shots and then a couple of like a little bit of lines here and there. He hands something to Richard or Stanley at some Now, he's point. the one who played for the Oilers, right? He was an NFL player. Correct, yeah. And he, so he, had the, he also had the, the episode Friends. Of right, driver. where he was uh, the the husband of the photographer woman. Right, and he played for the Titans. Oh yeah, he says he in that episode of MacGyver. <laughs> folks, look up this episode of MacGyver. No, don't. It's don't, a waste of your time. But um, he says that he plays for the Titans, but the Titans didn't exist as a team yet, and he played for the Oilers, who became the Titans. Wow. I don't understand. Mind there's there's got to be an explanation to that that we don't understand, but. But I just wanted to bring up another MacGyver connection. Yes. No, we have to touch on them. But yeah. And uh, another uh, character in this scene. We, well, we see Cutshaw sitting at the table. And the bikers are recognizing him from appearances he's made on television. He's or maybe reports about astronaut. him. Yeah, the famous failed astronaut. Um, like, maybe, I mean, obviously, I didn't... Uh you know live through the great space race and and see astronauts on television but i don't think i could recognize a single astronaut well now you could 
No, I'm saying that I don't think like you wouldn't I'm... recognize Buzz if he showed up right now. Probably not. <laughs> oh, I would recognize Buzz Aldrin. Okay. Probably nobody else. Probably just Buzz. <laughs> um, yeah, he's I, got I that can, dome I... over his head. <laughs> okay, maybe in, in, in uniform. <laughs> he's got that purple thing on his like, arm that he shoots lasers with. I was like, I can Buzz, name a lot of astronauts Buzz only Lightyear? because I've seen oh. like the right stuff. Sure. Apollo yeah. 13 and things like that. It's like, yeah. Just I'm, like, oh, I'm, I know that guy. He looks exactly like Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like people from movies. But yeah, so Cutshaw is sitting at a at a, a booth and he has uh, five, five shots. Yeah, he has five scotches in front of him and he stops a waitress and orders a sixth one. And she says, you have five there. And he says, I wanted six. <laughs> but the woman playing this waitress is Linda Blatty, who is William Peter Blatty's wife. Um and then a fight breaks out. Um, an insane fight. Uh, the, the, the head biker goes and sits opposite Cutshaw in the booth mm-hmm. and calls him out for who he is. Well, he's got a bet with the other guy. Yeah. That he's like, you know, this is, this is the astronaut and like, tell, tell him who you are. And, and he rips his dog tags off Yeah, he gets his dog prove. tags off his neck and he's like, look, see, this is the guy. This is Cutshaw. I told you. And then they beat up Cutshaw for like probably eight minutes. <laughs> before Kane finally arrives because he's woken up and found out what happened and decides that he's going to interrupt this beating. Well, yeah, he finds out what happens cause the, because the waitress, trying to help the guy out, obviously not wanting to take on this entire breaker game, goes into the back room to make a phone call, calls the operator and says, is there some sort of, like, institution around here for military servicemen? Yeah. And I'm just like... First of all, weird, wh- weird coincidence that weirdly, you would ask that. Yeah, weirdly specific that you would think this guy's crazy and he's in the military, so there must be a, a, a place around here where he's supposed to be, and that the operator then could find you a phone number for that place. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> also, nine one one is the number you were looking for. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna call and ask for some random military installation slash psych ward. I don't need to call the police. Um, but when Kane shows up, they basically just rope him into their bullying and they start forcing him to do humiliating things. Like one of the first things is they tell him to say things to the to the room full of people like yeah. Marines all suck. Yeah. And every time he does it, it makes them more angry because yeah. they right. think he won't do it and we'll get to beat him up. But he keeps doing it and we can't beat him up and that makes me mad. Yeah. Right. Then they right. tell so him to lick the floor worse. and then he licks the floor. But they don't show it. Right. And I think that that... It's because Stacey Keach was like, no, I'm not going to lick the floor. Uh, probably. <laughs> uh, I, I, I was thinking more that they, they, they have humiliated the Marines enough. And this is one thing that they will they not... They weren't going to show in the movie. They weren't going to show the sure. Marines doing this. Um, and they go back to beating on Cutshaw for a while. Um, and then it seems like they're like sexually assaulting him. Oh, yeah. Um, against oh, the bar. Yeah. And everyone is just watching. Like all the the whole crowd that was gathered there is just smiling and watching them sexually assault Cutshaw on the floor, and then uh, they shove Kane around for a while, and then he loses it. Oh yeah, it's it's really magical. I I, I was waiting for it the whole time. The tension buildup is perfect. Yeah, like it gets just to the point where you're like, come on, just kill these guys and even the introduction for it is so slow when he finally does lose it his hand is just slowly reaching into frame towards the big bad biker and wraps around his hand on the glass that he's holding and even like the second their hands touch the biker knows like i am totally screwed here Uh, and the both of their hands are shaking like he's gripping him tighter and tighter and tighter until finally the glass shatters in the biker's hand and just slices all of his fingers in the palm of his hand open and he opens his hand and it's just covered in like bloody glass and he just starts wailing on everybody i think he kills everyone except for cut shot yeah i did not expect that like he he starts to go crazy and i'm like oh great he's finally beating him up and then they they show the aftermath and you're just like (laughs) oh everyone's dead i don't think he killed the waitress that called no the facility we don't see her in the aftermath but yeah that woman gets her head thrown against the back of the bar room wall yeah and uh so and then presumably word has already gotten back to the facility because the police are there mm-hmm. with fell or i keep calling him fell he's he's hudson kane well that's how he's the permanently name he's credited using, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and they say well 
I know you wanted your brother to come back here, but that's really not an option anymore. He killed like 18 people well, at a bar. Well, he is back there. Yeah, he, right, he made but, it back before the police got there. But the police said he can't stay here. We Correct. want to take him into right, custody right, right. and you have to give him to us. Well, they, they're just like, give him to us or we're going to just go drag him out of here ourselves. Yeah. We'll go find him. But then Groper totally steps up. Yeah. He's like, you just wait a second. Yeah. Like, even, you know, like, it's like, yeah, come on. Yeah, we got more people here than you did. You didn't bring enough people here to tell us what we can and can't do. Um, and we have this scene with uh, Cutshaw and uh, Kane sitting in a chair wearing like a trench coat near a fireplace. Mm-hmm. And they have basically the, the culmination of their conversation where Cutshaw finally tells him. Why won't you go to the moon? Yeah, what, what his problem was and why he had the breakdown. And he confesses that he had a very strong suspicion that he would die there which was given to him by Reagan, who tells him, you're going to die up there in The Exorcist. Um, and that if uh, if he died in space, that he would die all alone. He's terrified of dying alone. And he's having a conflict of faith. And if there's no God, then dying in space is as alone as you could possibly die. Like, if there is a God, then at least you're dying and you're going to end up in a place with someone. But if you die in space and God doesn't exist then you're dying as alone as anything has ever died in the history of life. And that's terrifying to him. And that's why he had his breakdown. Um, and Cutshaw says that he's going to show him that true, that, that love can exist in this world and that a selfless love can exist. Cain kind of falls asleep in the chair. Like he passes out. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. As far as Cutshaw knows, Cain passed out in his chair, probably exhausted from this barroom fight. Exhausted um, from killing 25 yes. bikers. <laughs> um, and he goes over to Kane on the chair and kind of lifts the St. Christopher's medal, but then like leaves it on him. He's like, no, no, you you keep it. And, uh, and he walks out of the room and then he notices that there's blood on his shoe when he's not bleeding. And Kane wasn't visibly bleeding. And then he realizes that Kane didn't just fall asleep, that Kane has been stabbed. But Kane stabbed himself. Yeah, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he hasn't been stabbed. He Yeah. He, yeah. He, he gutted himself. He, he yeah. gutted himself with the knife that the biker had. He took the knife and uh as soon as Cutshaw walks out of the room, we see the knife fall out of Kane's jacket covered in blood and his hand is covered in blood because he he cut himself open. Right. Um I'm not exactly sure how this is a selfless act. Well, it comes into play later. Okay. But he kills himself here. Cutshaw carries his body downstairs. It feels like an Edward Scissorhands moment. Oh, yeah. Uh, where she walked down, walks yeah, yeah. down with all the, the scissor hands, and she's like, oh, he fell out the window. They both died. Yeah. So just leave him alone. But instead, it looks like I totally just killed this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. It does look like that, too. But he's, he's like, like just shaken and upset and like sure. just and, destroyed and as he's fell. carrying this body down the stairs. I don't even know how he's carrying this he's man probably wearing a brace or something yeah because yeah. he is a very slight man in this movie and kane is a, big. a bigger guy yeah stacy keach is a large man although he's very thin in this movie there's a couple scenes like early in the movie where he's like standing and he's like he's broad-shouldered but mm-hmm. he's he's very thin here thinner than i remember seeing him but uh fell knows that he didn't kill him because yeah. he's seen these two act as friends this well, whole time and he knew what was coming right and so obviously he's devastated to have lost his brother again um and because we did some very elaborate things to try to save this man yes (laughs) very expensive military (laughs) money we're not going to get back (laughs) Um, we're in a war right now what are we doing yeah so now we cut to months years later who knows yeah the place is shut down yeah um cut shot is pulling up in a in a car he's being driven but he pulls up in a car with a license plate that just says nasa (laughs) yeah so I, maybe he works at NASA again and is working in official capacity, or he's just a no. crazy person who bought a vanity plate. <laughs> like the, the answer to that would be no. Yeah. We, when you go into an institution, you don't get to hire back. No, well, but I think he. I think he is though. I think the I think the implication is, is that, that he's he totally has, cured. That he has a he has a subordinate that is driving him around. And I don't he think works he's for NASA. I don't think he's an astronaut anymore. Like I don't think he's literally going to sent on getting sent on a mission. But I think he's there. He, he works in the facility. He has some kind of a desk job at NASA now. Yeah, see, I, I, I felt that he was a veteran who was being escorted. But uh, even, I don't know why it would say NASA on the car the side of the car, car said NASA. Not just the vanity plate. The side of the car said NASA. Okay. So it's a, it's a NASA car. So he likes NASA and painted NASA on his car. <laughs> 
why would NASA drive him out there? Because he wanted to see the facility. Because he's an important man at NASA. <laughs> yeah, he's important enough. No it's, I don't think the the chauffeur is picking where he goes. I think he told the guy to take him to this hospital. And he had access to a company car. Because because of all those NASA facilities in the Pacific. Yeah. He North told him West. to drive. He drove from Florida. <laughs> 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 that really doesn't make any sense. Oh, no. This is a rental car. We rented it at the NASA rental. It's like it's like the old pro- male prospect uh, police car. <laughs> yeah. The Blues Brothers. It's, not- <laughs> it's like, why is this here? This doesn't make sense. But um, so uh, Kutchaw goes inside and he looks from room to room for any kind of a sign because uh, he was promised by Cain that if there was an afterlife, it would give him an indication. And uh, he doesn't find anything. And he stands where Cain's desk was and pulls a letter out of his pocket and reads it. And it's a letter from Cain that says that he killed himself. This is where mm-hmm. he's admitting, where we're finding out that he committed suicide so that he could do this one final thing. And this is where we get the recurring the, the phrase shock treatment. Right. Where he says, like, not a literal shock, like electrocution, but I'm shocking you with this information mm-hmm. to cure you. So, Cain went to this bar to die. Right. He must have written this letter before he went yeah. to the bar. Or at, at some point before, but because he certainly was in no condition to write it on his quote-unquote death chair. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, actually. It, it didn't occur to me when he wrote this letter. And I mean, the timing between him getting back and the police arriving isn't super clear. But he was in no condition, I feel, physically, physically okay. to, yeah, to, maybe. To, to thoughtfully write a letter. Or maybe he wrote this letter the second he, he had developed that relationship with Cutshaw and was like, you know, when I die, give this letter to Cutshaw. Mm-hmm. Like, there's, he doesn't mention the bar fight or anything, so it's not like he couldn't have written it earlier. But we're hearing little clips of the conversation about proving that there's an afterlife. But he doesn't find anything here. And when he gets back in the car to drive away, he realizes, oh, what? I have the St. Christopher medal. And mm-hmm. he like accuses the driver of having planted it on him. And the driver's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he turns it over in his hand to see that it is, in fact, his St. Christopher medal. Right. That was presumably buried with Cain. I'm going to say that's probably the case. Mm-hmm. But the implication is that this is the sign from Cain that there is an afterlife. And I killed myself specifically so that I could prove to you that there's an afterlife. So that you don't have to go crazy when you die, that there's no God or mm. higher power, so that you can spend the rest of your life knowing that there's something greater than us. Yeah. And that's the last shot of the movie. We freeze frame on him in the car. Yeah, I didn't like that. Which we didn't need to do. Uh, but I also don't like that he finds it in the car. It should have been in the building somewhere. It should have been in the building somewhere. Like, I mean, I know you could think that, oh, he just dropped it but i mean the miracle on 34th street cane you know leaning up against the fireplace or something like yeah. that like even because the whole place is emptied out so you wouldn't think that someone would have just left this sitting in the middle of a room yeah it would have to have been a sign that's what he went there to, to find yeah why it, it's in the car and, and it's an 80 yard line while out, outside of the car you yeah. don't see him find it in the car yeah, it, it's it, like an overhead shot, and he says, "Wait, stop the car! What is this? What Where does the this come from? metal come from?" And then it shows him in the car. It's like, I feel like it was an afterthought. It was an afterthought, and or or the scene was him in the car, and he finds the metal, and ends on that note. But they, it wasn't clear enough, so they had to add this line. Well, of, yeah, because otherwise they would have thought that he had it the whole time. Right. Yeah, that's possible. It's also. Um, interesting because these two things are countries apart the the set of the actual building is in hungary and Mm -hmm. then pulling up in the car is actually in germany at this castle right so it would have been shot like super far apart and obviously a skeleton crew because it's just the two actors um but yeah that's the end of the movie and uh then we pick up that story with exorcist three well was the the line he says, like, he was a killer. He's like, no, he was a lamb. Yeah, he says, oh, this is this is where that hospital was, right? I heard I heard they had a doctor who was actually, like, a killer. And he said he was a lamb. So are we assuming that this is the parallel of the P.T. Barnum story? Right, but I think that's just wishful thinking on Cutshaw's part because he's obviously the panther. Mm-hmm. Because, he, like, 
even his like redeeming thing that he did was murder 18 people in a bar like mm-hmm. <laughs> he's still a terrible person and it's like it's he's friends with you because he ate other people like right you're the lamb he's the panther because the only reason he didn't kill you is because he killed a bunch of people already and he yeah. didn't need to kill another person yet um but yeah and that's that's the film it's incredible i love it i i, mean, I just wanted to bring up some interesting like trivia go for it because uh blatty used a lot of actors that he used before sure and would use Since, actors yeah. later of the same and I really like some of the original like casting choices of some of the things. Like I really liked his original thought of having Nicole Williamson as Kane, and I was like, oh man, I would have really liked that. Yeah, because I like Nicole Williamson a lot. Uh, but uh, and then uh, I think it was according to this is Michael Moriarty would have played the uh, Cutshaw character, uh, who I'm not as familiar with. I think Scott Wilson nails it. No, I I, I agree, um, but. Uh, and while I, while I think Stacey Keach's performance was interesting, um, in my mind, like seeing Nicole Williamson in that character, I was like, oh yeah. You know, it's funny. I don't actually know who Nicole Williamson is. Oh, uh, he he played in Return to Oz. He was the Doctor slash Gnome King. He was in Excalibur. He was in the. Uh, no, you haven't you haven't sat down and watched Excalibur together yet. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, it's eighty one, so we'll get there. Yeah. Um, uh, he was in the Seven Percent Solution, the Sherlock Holmes with Adam Alan Arkin. Sure, yeah. Uh, he's a really interesting actor, uh, comedian. Just had a weird, a weird sense to him, almost like a Peter Sellers, where where like he's really funny or interesting on screen, but his his outside life is also a little bit bizarre. Yeah, and he's got a lot of interesting philosophies on life and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, so I, I and he was in Exorcist three playing a character. Oh, okay. Uh, so he got to was he was it just a scheduling conflict that he wasn't available for this? Um, the trivia doesn't go into details. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm I'm pulling these from IMDb trivia because I'm lazy. Uh, but uh, I just thought it was interesting. I, I was like, yeah, I liked that. I liked that choice. Yeah, it's funny. I I like I said before, I don't think I've seen Stacy Keach this young before, but um, younger, he reminded me. A little bit of Doug Benson, especially because he looked so stoned okay, yeah, in so yeah, much yeah. of the footage. But um, I feel like he could totally be Doug Benson's dad and something. He's still around. Oh yeah. Oh, he he was great on. His speech was great on Titus. Yeah, that that was one of the. <laughs> that's honestly the first thing I think of for him. He was Ken Titus, the the father of uh, Christopher, Christopher Titus, Titus on yeah. that show. And I I didn't watch a lot of that show. But what I watched of it, he was phenomenal every time. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just like the super intimidating grandfather type character. Um, uh, him and his brother James uh, will show up later this year in The Long Riders. Yes. Which is the Western that has like four sets of brothers in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got like the Carradines. And... Yeah. Um, yeah. Who else is in it? It's the Carradines and the Quades, the Quades I yeah. think, are in there. Yeah. Um, he also plays uh, Sarge Stadanko in Nice Dreams, the Cheech and Chong movie, which <laughs> I, I remember him from that because I used to play on Comedy Central all the time when I was a kid. Uh, he obviously played Mike Hammer on uh, television uh, from the uh, Mickey Spillane detective novels. And he's also Commander Malloy in Escape from L.A., which is better than people remember. <laughs> is um, it? it is. Um, I didn't realize that William Peter Blatty, one of his early credits, he co-wrote um, A Shot in the Dark the second pink panther movie oh really with uh okay with blake edwards yeah blake edwards um so i thought that was interesting um and uh scott wilson as captain billy cutshaw a bunch of stuff but probably best known currently from having played herschel on the walking dead well no longer currently but well yes. i'm saying currently that's what he's known for I mean, he well, passed yes. away he's not still that character oh. and the character and actor are both no longer with oh. us but uh i i mean I really enjoyed his performance on The Walking Dead because there's not a lot. Of that. I really fell out of love with that show pretty quickly. Sure, but he was one of the best parts of that show. Yeah, uh, and he was absolutely fabulous in this movie and totally adorable. He's really he's really cute and endearing the whole time. Um, he's able to to straddle that line between like obnoxious and just genuinely funny every time he says something and fell says something too uh somewhere in the middle of the movie about how all these men like in addition to showing signs of uh psychopathy or however you would pronounce psychopathy yeah um uh they're all legitimate geniuses too like they all have super high iqs Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, it shows. I think all the dialogue uh, is very smart, um, which is a testament to Blatty's work. But um, all these people are believably genius level intelligence. Um, Jason Miller, uh, obviously Lieutenant Reno, who we said was Father Karras, uh, the young priest in The Exorcist, and inexplicably comes back for Exorcist 3 as a different character. Yeah. Um, so he plays three different characters in our, in in our official trilogy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, uh, Ed Flanders, not Ned Flanders, Ed Flanders uh, is the Fell character. Mm -hmm. um, he is President Truman in MacArthur. He's Dr. Westfall, the father of Tommy Westfall on St. Elsewhere. Yeah. You know who Tommy Westfall is? Uh, I don't remember who Tommy Westfall is, but... Uh... Jess, Tommy Westfall, does that ring a bell? No. On St. Elsewhere. So there's this this theory called the Tommy Westfall universe. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. And now so I recall. So the finale of St. Elsewhere uh, indicates that the entire series took place in the imagination of Tommy Westfall, um, who is uh, Ed Flanders' son on the show. Um, and because of crossovers that St. Elsewhere has done with other shows, and those it turns episodes, out, yeah, and those and shows those have shows done other crossing crossovers. Over. So it's like The Simpsons, X Files, Cheers, like Wing, every or, like every show yeah, Wings, from the late Frasier 90s. Was on Wings. Yeah, yeah. Early, early to late nineties, like eighties through nineties, every single show is somehow connected and is all taking place in Tommy Westfall's imagination. Um, uh, Ed Flanders is also in Exorcist Three. Mm -hmm. um, he, he he replaces Father Dyer. Did you ever see the movie Bye Bye Love? I didn't. Um, it was basically a McDonald's commercial, but it was much better than Mac and Me. Um, <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it, the critics disagree with me because I looked it up and they, it is not well remembered. But um, it's like Paul Reiser and Randy Quaid, I think, and somebody else. And they're like these divorced dads. Oh, I liked this movie. Yeah. I remember this it's one. It's very cute. I, um, people and, didn't like that movie? I don't think so. Oh. I think it was kind of cheesy and it was like 100% paid for by McDonald's, which oh. this movie's paid for by Pepsi. What? Who cares who paid for the who movie? Who cares? I mean, they paid for it because it was realistic that divorced dads would meet in a McDonald's to, yeah. to come see their kids. Because it's somewhere easy to get food for kids that they'll actually eat the food. Yes. yes. But um, but one of the plots of the movie is uh, that one of, the, one of the daughters of the men uh, has a boyfriend that works at this McDonald's. And... Uh, the boyfriend get, there's like some kind of a car accident scene at the end of the movie um and the boyfriend is getting blamed for it and like the police are interrogating him and saying that he did something wrong and a co-worker of the boyfriend steps up and it's this 65 70 year old man that's ed flanders oh mm. that's I remember the brother that scene. Yeah. yeah and he yeah, stands yeah. up and he's like this is my boss yeah and he's a teenager but he's very responsible yeah. and he like stands up for yep. him and it's like this really great touching scene at the end of the movie and i always remember that scene it turns out that's the same guy that plays kane's brother here uh -huh. um so i just thought it was worth mentioning just because i really like that scene um you have neville brand as uh marvin groper major marvin groper who uh will come back in without warning uh later this year without warning <laughs> we won't even see it coming <laughs> um, in 1950, uh, he was in a film noir directed by Otto Preminger called Where the Sidewalk Ends, which I didn't realize was a movie before it was, before a, it was a children's uh, Silverstein uh, poem poetry book. collection. <laughs> um, it precedes the poetry book by 24 years. Um, he also plays uh, Boyd Kane in Kansas City Confidential. It was a really cool gangster movie. Um, what year was that one? Um, 52. I was going to say 50s. Uh, and uh, he's also Lieutenant Kaminsky in Tora Tora Tora. Yeah, I was, and I, I noticed he was also in Stalag Seventeen as Duke, and I can't remember who the character of Duke I is, and movie. I can't picture who he is in that movie because I'm pretty familiar with the movie. Uh, but uh, yeah, I got nothing for him on in that. Uh, George Desenzo is Captain Fairbanks, who is the one who is trying to bust open the wall to get through it. Um, oh, there is a scene that we skipped over from him. He's floating in a pool and he's complimenting the atoms oh, of the pool that yes. they're more cooperative. <laughs> I loved that. It was just such a funny callback. Like, yeah, his water was... molecules are cooperative. <laughs> yeah, he was so mad at the wall before, <laughs> but he approves of the pool. But he plays Sam Baines in Back to the Future. I don't know who Sam Baines is. Uh, that is Lorraine's father. Oh, so okay. So it's like, you ever oh, have a that, kid that's yep. stupid all his Sonya? Yeah. yeah. He's like, what are you talking about? This is a brand new episode. Uh, Major Benchley in Close Encounters. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of yeah. military and close encounters, so I can't so really... he, Yeah, he could have been. There's like 300 people standing around. Uh, I'm, but station. I'm wondering if that's a callback to Jaws, Peter Benchley. Yeah, I was going to say, Benchley is not a coincidence, I don't think. 
Um, he's also an Exorcist III. Uh, Moses Gunn uh, was Major Namek, who is uh, Bumpy Jonas in Shaft. Um, he's Dr. Pinchot in Firestarter. Yeah. Um, and he is Chiron in NeverEnding Story. I don't know who that is. Chiron. Uh, yeah, so is he's like the he's a soldier at the... No, he, he is basically the prime minister of Fantasia. Oh, okay. Uh, so like, but he's on the roof of that building. With right, the he's, he's the one who's coming out and saying the, the, the empress is ill. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. I, yes, I recall that guy. Um, Robert Loja as Lieutenant Benish is obviously amazing. Yeah. Um, Robert all... Loja. <laughs> yeah, I always go back to that. The R for Robert Loja. <laughs> See, uh, o is in... Oh, is that Robert Loja? <laughs> I, I think his most famous role was in a Minute Maid commercial where there's a little kid that doesn't want to drink the juice. And she's like, why don't you want to drink the juice? It's made from real fruits or something like that. Like, who would you like, trust? Who would you trust to, to tell you to drink this juice? And he's like, I don't know. Maybe Robert Loja. And then Robert Loja comes in. He's like, hey, kid, drink your juice. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> the kid's just like, Robert Loja. Like, so excited to see Robert Loja. Uh, he also has another great Family Guy thing where it just cuts to him with a black background pointing at the camera going, not okay. <laughs> like, and that's like, it? They out would, of context? Well, no, it would be out in context, but after like a bad joke. Yeah. Like one of them is Mayor West. He's dating this girl and he goes, I think I should tell you, I have AIDS. And she goes, what? He's like, they're over there. They're yeah, waiting to the take mayor. us back home. He's like, oh, hi, sir. We're waiting for you over here. He's like, poor guys. They both have AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> And then it just comes to Robert Loja pointing at screen going, not okay! Yeah, he, uh, he, obviously people probably actually know him from Big, where he was the boss at the toy mm, company. Yeah. Um, Independence Scarface. Day. Independence okay, Day, yeah. yeah. I, I always go to Scarface first just because him, him as Frank in that movie is amazing. Mm-hmm. The... I get him and Jack Warden confused. That, that's fair. Uh, I can see that. When, whenever I'm trying to picture Robert Loja in a role, I always somehow end up on a jack warden and they, they both do comedy like full-heartedly like they're mm-hmm. just like i'm committing 100 percent to this character and whatever you tell me to do we'll we'll get it done yeah um but uh he's also uh jason cutler in over the top um he's dr bill raymond in psycho 2 did you say you get him confused with jack warden mm-hmm because i was like you know who i get him confused with and i was just looking it up i'm like that guy from toys Oh, that's Jack Warden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're very similar, and they get yeah. similar roles, yeah. too. Um, but I, I met him. Uh, he came and did a guest appearance on Tom Goes to the Mayor, and uh, I was standing in the parking lot waiting for him to park and to lead him into our offices, and he stopped me on the way into the building, and he pointed at the, the ashtray outside the door. And he's like, you see those cigarettes? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, tombstones. <laughs> I was like, all right. Yeah, I don't smoke, but... And he's like, where are we going? <laughs> I took him upstairs into the offices, but he's a funny guy. I think they dress him up in like a like a Gorton's Fisherman. Uh, I know what you did last summer, like yellow jacket. Rain and sticker. had him like... I think I could be mixing it up with a different character, but I think he was like a guy who ran like a local like fish restaurant. He was just shouting at the camera, but... He's always hilarious. I, I always love loved that story. <laughs> Every yeah. time you tell it, I love it. <laughs> I think I mentioned it on the MacGyver podcast. <laughs> and I'll repeat it every time we have Robert Loja in a movie. Um, and then obviously Tom Atkins is Sergeant Krebs, uh, who we had in Fog, and he will be back next year for Escape from New York with John Carpenter. Um, Jess, up or down? Oh, it's a big thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to be an up from me. All right. And that's three, obviously. I spoiled that at the beginning. Um, where is this going on your letterbox? Uh, so top of my list. This one's uh, this one's number one. I want Richard to say the same thing. He wasted uh, all that time trying to find uh, the list. And now... uh, uh, <laughs> I really don't want to say it's my number one. Maybe next time we should have Richard go first. Or... <laughs> So it doesn't look like I'm just you're just like pointing a gun at I my just, head. Can I Which just one say, do you like, Richard? Can I just say how ecstatic I am that you spent all of that time trying to find your list so that you could tell me it was on top, <laughs> not that it was like in the middle or something? Like you didn't decide earlier today. I, I I haven't decided. I'm I'm deciding literally at this moment. Where's it going? 
It's going at the top. Of course it's going at the top. It's going at the top. It's at the top of all three of our lists. We finally have the same movie on the top because yeah. this movie is phenomenal. It's pretty great. And everybody should go buy it right now. This is this is the first like I, gem for I, me. I had never I had never heard of this movie. Yeah. Never It's incredible. Never heard of it. Not even didn't sound familiar whatsoever. And it did not let me down. But I, I think can't that is to show it to people. Uh, yeah, like, I, absolutely. I mean, like I, I want to show this movie to people. Yeah, we're we're sharing it right now with the listeners. With um, the world, the whole world is listening. We're that big already. Um, I think that is everything for this movie. Uh, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. Again, if you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintage video podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Coal Miner's Daughter, which IMDb calls the biographical story of Loretta Lynn, a legendary country singer that came from poverty to worldwide fame. Mm-hmm.